And song number 585 in your psalm book, 585. Let's stand together. We'll sing it out there all on that first stanza, 585. Everyone standing if you're able, everyone singing. Let's sing it out there on the first. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is rambling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed his faithful binding of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps his day is marching on glory glory hallelujah oh glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah his day is on that last answer in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Blessed, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm 33, 12 tells us that. Amen. And I'm so thankful. I'm, I'm glad to be an American. I really am. I'm, I'm a flag-waving American. I set out flags on my property yesterday, and uh, we got a flag on our flagpole. Amen. But more than that, it's what we believe in our hearts, those principles. Amen. And uh, thank God for America, and obviously, in that order, we thank God. Hey, Connor, look at you, buddy, amen. He's waving, waving at mom, amen. I thought he was waving at me, amen. <laughs> then I looked and saw mom over there, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Brother Stark, right where you are, sir, would you please open us in prayer? Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Take a song book there. Turn to song number 583. 583. My country, tis of thee. Let's stand together. We'll sing that first stanza. We'll take a moment to greet each other to church this morning. 583 on the first. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my father's time, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Good singing. Take a moment. Get your neighbor church this morning. Five hundred and eighty-three. Let's sing it out there on that second stanza. Five hundred and eighty-three on the second. On the second. My native country, the land of the noble free, thy name I love. I On that last, all together, 583. Our fathers got to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be prime with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God. Sing. You may be seated there or head back to your pew, whichever way you're on the way there. Just a few announcements in regarding this week's here and what's coming up here at Loomis Park Baptist Church. There is, and I already announced it to the choir, there is no choir practice tonight. 
due to the fact that we have a picnic down at the pavilion and an afternoon service. I don't want to keep you here after that. So after that's done, unless you're sticking around for the softball game that supposedly is supposed to break out, it always does. Who are we kidding? Uh, then that, there'll be no choir practice, all right, for the choir members. And then this Saturday, July 9th, we're excited. We do have several flowers left. There's a good chunk gone. I'm encouraged by that. Thank you, church, for taking those and getting those out for our vacation Bible school. They're all over there by the water cooler there on that little skinny table between the bathrooms there. Several more left that need to go out. They have the registration form on the back there in the, the great uh, fly, or the front on the front there. Uh, we're excited about it there, but we need some help. Let's get the rest of those out here in the next few weeks because vacation Bible school is July. Good, it's up there. You can't fail this test through the what? The 22nd. What time does it start? Good. What time does it end? Good. Let's know these details. They're on the cards as well. We want to know what we're talking about and invite folks. Hey, our vacation Bible school is when? July 18th. There we go. Just, I'm, I'm just messing with you today. Uh, but let's invite folks. Let's get out there. Let's get those uh, flyers out to our community. And then if you're interested in helping, you can see there's a table right in the lobby as you turn right there just before you go out the main doors to your right. Below the TV over there, you'll see a, a table there that's, uh, if you could there, there's uh, Miss Carrie would normally be there or someone to be there. Uh, if you'd like to help, if you'd like to do something during vacation Bible school, uh, stop there and to see if there's something that you can do. Let's all get involved. Uh, let's be a church that gets behind uh, this event here and let's work, all right? Let's invite folks. Let's invite kids. Let's get here on a week, during the week that week, uh, serve in a class, serve down there at the games, uh, or do something. All right, uh, let's all be a part of that there. And then if you'd like to, uh, those of you who have kids, let's register our kids online. All right, instead of taking those cards, we want to use those for the community and get those out on doors and in, uh, in folks' hands. But uh, for our church members, if you'd like to register your child, you can do so online. And if you need help getting that direction, come see me after the service. Pastor Brent? Well, we made it back from Cape camp safely. Sorry, I'm already out of it. Um, but thank you for those that supported us by giving pop cans, donating money. Uh, we've had a great, uh, we had a great week at camp. Hopefully you'll stay around for the afternoon service to hear the testimonies, uh, how God uh, spoke to our teenagers. It was a blast. No one got seriously hurt as far as I know. Um, and so, but again, thank you for your prayers uh, while we were away. This Wednesday, uh, uh, we will have King Josiah's uh, summer Bible Club, summer toddler class, um, and the youth group will be downstairs with myself, and Pastor will continue his uh, series, Growing in Grace. And then uh, next Monday uh, through Friday is junior camp, the last camp of the summer, <laughs> uh, at junior camp. And so next Sunday, next Sunday after the evening service, I'd like to meet down front here uh, so we can go over uh, junior camp. If you have a child uh, going to junior camp, I can give you some more information uh, on what time we're leaving, when we should be back, and whatnot. That's next uh, Sunday. And then Sunday, August 28th, is Promotion Sunday, where our kids uh, promote to the next class. And then uh, after the afternoon service uh, today, Miss Carrie would, ne would, like to, uh, would need some help uh, getting some things for Vacation Bible School out of the barn. And so if you could just uh, meet at the barn after the afternoon service to help her get some things inside the church. Pastor? It's upon us, amen. This, this wonderful season is upon us. Again, uh, today is our Independence Day picnic and afternoon service. Those of you who have never been a part of it, um, you can, uh, after the service here, you can drive down or you can just walk down, follow the wagon tracks, as we say, down to our pavilion. And the church is preparing uh, hamburgs and hot dogs. We have chips and uh, drinks for, for everyone. You don't have to bring anything, just yourself. And then we usually go, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll start our afternoon service, and uh, Pastor Brent will be preaching. Our teens will be giving their testimony, so please uh, don't miss that. You see out in the hallway there, there is a table, and uh, it has uh, a box in it, and it is marked Adopt-A-Cop. Uh, how many of you are familiar with our Adopt-A-Cop program? Amen. Many of you are, many of you are not. Um, we, we support our troopers. By the way, we say that 
uh, we support our troopers, amen. Uh, our state police post is one mile up the road, and uh, we, there are roughly 60 troopers. And what we do here is those that would like to, that are members of Loomis Park Baptist Church, uh, if you'd like to have a trooper assigned to you, uh, we'll, we'll give you a trooper, and then what we do is several times during the year, we will give them uh, small gifts, little let them know cards, let them know we're praying for them, uh, praying for their family. And so Miss Heidi is putting together a small gift. Uh, they are $8, so we're asking those of you that are already part of Adopt-A-Cop, if you would just kindly drop $8 there in that uh, bo box. If you want to just make it a part of your offering, just mark your envelope. That's fine. Um, we're going to give them a little gift in August, Lord willing. And in that gift, we are going to give them an invitation to our classic Sunday in September. Amen. So uh, if you could, it's $8 per family if you have uh, a trooper already. If you're interested in being part of the Adopt-A-Cop program, there is a sign-up sheet out there. Uh, please do that. Just sign up. Sign, I'm interested in that. Uh, we would love to get you. There, there's always turnover. There's always uh, times where troopers are moving on and new troopers come. And so there's always opportunities uh, to be able to uh, have troopers. And again, to pray for them, let them know they're appreciated. And uh, they certainly do appreciate it. Last time uh, we were there, Pastor Alex, they said, and Pastor Brent, I know you were there too. They said, this is the talk of the post every time you guys come. And I think last we brought donuts, or which I thought was really funny because police officers and donuts, you know, but they said they love them. Amen. So praise the Lord. Uh, so $8 per family, and it's a, a special gift that Miss Heidi is putting together. And pray for Miss Heidi today. She's, she's down, not feeling well. Amen. And of course, she's nigh unto giving birth as well. And she's married to this guy, so she needs prayer. Amen. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, amen. A couple other items for Vacation Bible School. We have some craft items that we need. You'll not be getting these back, okay? Uh, that is, we need 75 uh, 10 and 3 quarter ounce soup or veggie cans, the small cans for crafts. Um, we need 20 paper towel tubes. We need 35 cardboard egg cartons. And then we have some decorating items that we're looking to get. You will get these back if you put your name on them. You don't put your name on them, we sell them on eBay. No, just kidding, amen. Uh, we, we, have, we need some hiking and camping supplies, backpacks, sleeping bags, canteens, hiking, walking sticks, and hiking boots, amen, strictly for decorative purposes. We have been mentioning at the end of July, the 24th, we have missionary Brent Hoffman, missionary to Belgium. Our missionary is going to be reporting, 6 o'clock Sunday night service. And then on the 31st, missionary to South Africa, Brother Eric Graham, one of our longest-serving missionaries is going to be reporting uh, 6, 6 p.m. service there as well. And I saw Miss Barb. Did I see Miss Barb? I saw Miss Barb. Miss Barb is getting ready to head to the country of Chad. Amen. And it's going to be there for a month. So be in prayer for Miss Barb. Amen. And we got, we got your letter, Miss Barb. Amen. This week and going to be officially retiring from Bibles International in at the end of August and excited for her. I know she's... she's uh, cautiously, optimistically excited. Amen. And uh, God called her off the mission field to take care of her sweet mama. Uh, boy, I, I, when you put that date down, I couldn't believe that it had been that long, but it has. And uh, she's been honoring her mom. By the way, that's a commandment that has no expiration date. Honor thy father and thy mother. Amen. And it's the first commandment with promise. So be praying for Miss Barb in regards to her trip here from July into August. And remember, August, the Sunday nights in August, we'll have our tabernacle services. Today's almost a good kind of test run for it, amen. And uh, we love those evening services, August 7th, 14th, 21st, 28th. We'll, each of us will be preaching. I think the fellows will be preaching once. I'll be preaching twice at those services and uh, look forward to that food and fellowship after each service. Those of you that are new to our church, we don't pass offering plates, but I can assure you as an independent Baptist pastor, we do take offerings. We will receive your offering if you give it. Amen. And God's been good 
Uh, thank the Lord for his goodness, the faithfulness of God's people. We have missionaries uh, that we support, 57 of them, 57 missionaries that we support. And by the way, we can support more and we want to support more. Amen. And uh, so please, let's give uh, our bucket back there. It's called the Do It Right bucket. Make sure you get your offering in there. And uh, to those of you that are guests, please put your guest card in there. I know many of you have been visiting with us. It's been good to have you with us. Praise God. I want to say this morning, and I love doing this when they're talking, I want to say it's good to see Miss Kelsey McKinley back there. Amen. Bless you, Kelsey. Many of us have been praying for you. And thanks for dragging your hubby with you today. Did you pull him by the beard? Amen. And a good to see you, Brother James. Amen. And Miss Bonnie, it is so good to see you as well. Amen. And many of you have been praying for Miss Bonnie with her health issues. And uh, you know what? She's taking Miss Judy out of church tonight. Miss Judy came up to me and said, won't be here for the afternoon service. I said, that's it. You're fired. Amen. And uh, no, spending, spending the, the afternoon. And I understand on these kind of weekends, we got lots of folks away. And we have some folks that are ill too. But uh, good to see you, Miss Bonnie. So glad you're here. She said, thanks for all the prayers and don't stop. It's in all God's people said. And so many others. Mrs. Lawley, good to see you here today. And your mama, God bless you, Miss Ruthie. And each one of you that's here today, thank you. I see, oh my goodness, I see Jim and Donna there. God bless you, amen. So good to see you. Been, been missing you, amen. And uh, this is Dave Williams, uh, mom and stepdad. And uh, we appreciate you so much being with us. Well, we've got a special there, amen. You go right ahead. Amen. Page 587. Page 587. Stand with me. We'll sing all four stanzas of America the Beautiful. What a great song. Amen. Stand with me and sing. 587. Lift your voices now. Oh, beautiful for spacious sky, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains Hey! 
for heroes group who liberating strive who more than self their country love and mercy more than life America America may God thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gift on that last verse lift it up now oh beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years thine alabaster cities be undimmed by human tears America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good good singing. Please take your Bibles and go to the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at three different portions of Scripture this morning in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14, Proverbs chapter 16, and Proverbs chapter 1. We'll be reading just one verse in Proverbs chapter 14, 18 verses in Proverbs chapter 16, and 13 verses in Proverbs chapter 1. So we'll read Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 in unison together. <clears throat> and then we'll move over to Proverbs 16, read responsively. And then Proverbs 1, read responsively. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 34. Proverbs 14, verse 34. And let's read it together in unison. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Over to chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, reading responsively. I'll read the odd-numbered verses. You read the even-numbered verses aloud with me. Proverbs 16, verses 1 through 18. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Every one that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, though hand join in hand he shall not be unpunished. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. A divine sentence is in the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth not in judgment. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. It is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him that speaketh right. The wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. <clears throat> In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of latter rain. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold? and to get understanding, rather, to be chosen than silver. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. 
Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Over to Proverbs chapter 1, please. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 20 and reading down through verse 33. I'll read the even-numbered verses. You read responsively the odd-numbered verses. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Once as a child we wept and prayed on our knees. We called on the Lord our God for every need. But now we are full and free. There's no need to cry. And we're dying, and our eyes are all dry. Lord, let us weep again, let America weep. Sorrow and mourning bring joy to the soul. Of a broken heart will cleanse and make whole. Lord, let us weep again, let America weep. Dear people, we need to weep and pray for our land. Broken heart will break the pants. Oh, what will he have to do to break our hearts and cause us to weep again? Revival to start. Lord, let us weep again, let America weep, sorrow and mourning bring joy 
joy to the soul. Tears of a broken heart will cleanse and make whole. Lord, let us weep again. Let America weep. Lord, let us weep. Again, let America we Well, you somebody like that one there, Pastor Alex. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that. Brother Kevin, thank you so much for your ministry to us today, filling in for Miss Heidi. Miss Robin, thanks for that great special. Amen. I enjoyed that Star Spangled Banner as a, a blessing. Amen. Happy 246th birthday, America. Boy, that just doesn't seem possible, does it? I, I was just a little guy when America had their 200th birthday in 1976. And, uh, but it really, if you think about it, 2026 is right around the corner, and that'll be 250 years. And may I say, uh, we're getting a ring there, fellas. We, we're getting a little bit of feedback there. Uh, first and foremost that I'm a Christian. Amen. I'm a Christian. Amen. I, I, I must, forgive me, and some of you will say amen to this first word, I'm a stranger. Amen. Thank you, Brother Merrill. Amen. I knew I could count on you for an inappropriately placed amen. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Strangers and pilgrims, the Bible calls us believers. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Amen. So first and foremost, I, I'm a Christian. But I could say this without equivocation. I'm glad that God allowed me to be an American. I, I love this country. I, I was just reading uh, my grandfather's story of how he came to America, and I, I've shared it before. I'll just give you the, the short-run version. He was in Poland when the Nazis invaded from the West, and then the Russians invaded from the East. And the Russians conscripted all the Poles, sent them off to a concentration camp. A miraculous event happened where Stalin released them. Now, he didn't do that. He didn't do that with his own people. He sacrificed five million of his own people in World War II. But the Poles made their way down through Russia into a place called Persia, which is modern-day Iran, and into Iraq, and they hooked up with the British Fought. My grandfather was a mortarman, fought at the Battle of Monte Cassino and the Polish, they're called the Free Poles. Through that, he got British citizenship. Through that, he sent for my grandmother, having never met her. She was in a Russian concentration camp, and literally they were allowing Poles to take Polish wives. He sent for her. She came to England, met him for the first time. They got married, and through that, they got American citizenship. And I, my, my dad and my aunt were born, obviously, then I was born. Just, it absolutely amazes me, amen. I'm, I'm a flag-waving American. I love America. And uh, by the way, if you've been taught to hate America, I feel sorry for you. I really do, because there is still only one country that people float on boards and rickety rafts to get to. Only one. And it's this one. Amen. I love America. Does America have problems? Yes, she does. Goodness, yes. Does America have scarlet parts of her past? She does. You know what I found out? Anywhere you find people, you'll find problems. Amen. And that is in governments, in churches, in families. Amen. And so, yes, yes, I say that to all that. But she is still the greatest. But... I want to focus today, and just by way of our introduction, as we think about what makes America great. What is it that, that makes America great? We, we sung that song, America the Beautiful. I love that song. One of my favorite songs. You know, thine alabaster cities gleam, undimmed by human tears. I, I think about America, and think about, uh, just by way of a question, is, uh, is it America's amazing landscapes? Well, I'll tell you this, America does have some amazing landscapes. I, I, I've said before, my, my wife, uh, is, her family is Finnish, and they were actually planning, I believe this year, uh, to take a trip to Finland, but COVID 
uh, kind of put a put a uh, wrench in that. And I remember saying, you know, uh, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? You want to do this? She said, well, you know, one day, Lord willing, I'd love to, to see Europe and all that. She said, what about you? And I, I'm convinced of this. And I, there's some beautiful parts of Europe. And uh, I've been able to travel different places. But there's enough. If you spent your entire life traveling, you wouldn't ever have to leave America. Literally. I mean, there's just incredible uh, uh, landscapes, things to see, different things there in America. So America certainly could be great because she is breathtakingly beautiful. Well, how about this? Is America great because of her fertile fields? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, you think about just California alone. And I know we like to make the joke, uh, the land of the fruits, flakes, and nuts. That's California. Amen. But it is. Literally, it, it could have its own economy for how much food it produces out there. It's really our nation's grocery store. Uh, oranges and, and, and lemons and, and lettuce and all kinds of vegetables that grow. In Cal and that's just one out of 50. Amen. One state. Fertile fields. Oh, my goodness. Look across the Midwest and see the, see the corn and beans and wheat growing. Amen. That certainly we could say, well, that makes America great. How about her natural resources? I know there's a, a big philosophical debate going on, political, uh, about our natural resources, but I'm here to tell you something. America is rich with coal and oil and gold. Amen. Anybody remember, anybody remember studying the gold rush? Amen. Of 1849. Amen. Uh, gold and, and all kinds. Consider the power. If you've never been to Niagara Falls, I'd encourage you, Go. And look at that river and look at those falls and look at the power that's generated from that. That's right here in America. Amen. So is it our landscapes? Is it our, our fertile fields? Is it our natural resources? Something we don't think about in America, but I promise you uh, military folks do, are two oceans that shield us from trouble. Two big oceans that keep enemies from invading. We all, we all remember uh, December 7th, 1941. Amen. By the way, still had another 2,000 miles to go if they wanted to get to the California coast with those carrier divisions. Amen. Think about that. The Atlantic and the Pacific, they're natural barriers. Well, <clears throat> another aspect we could look at of America's greatness, would it be our, our amazing landscapes? Would it be our, our fertile fields? Would it be our natural resources? Would it be our oceanic defenses? Would it be our eco economy or our economic uh, doings? It certainly could be better than all God's people said. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, America's economy drives the world's economy. Amen. That's the, our, our America, amen. Our, our economic might. Hey, certainly we could look at our military, the greatness of America, and look at our military. Uh, I think about this in regards to not only uh, uh, our military might, but the fact is our soldiers have come when the world has called. There are Americans that have died in nearly every fly speck island all over this world for the freedom of others. By the way, not to colonialize as they teach, but to simply free people from those that would oppress. Oh, I think of something else that we could look at and say, is it possibly this that makes America great? I think of our compassion and kindness in the world. You know, when a, a country like Burma has an earthquake, you know what America does? America sends water and relief supplies that, by the way, in a military dictatorship, laid on the tarmac for months because they didn't want them to drink American water. Listen, Americans are kind and compassionate people. I think about it in regards to, if you're a student of history, you know at the end of World War II, Russia was closing in this way, and the United States was closing in this way on Germany. Can, can I ask you a question? Which way did the Germans run? Hmm? They ran toward the Americans. Now, I could, I could give you two reasons why. Number one, they had done total evils to the Russian people. So they knew the Russians were going to exact revenge, but they also knew that Americans were compassionate and kind. We are, amen? Not perfect, not perfect, but it's, 
It's something I think that makes America great. I think about our kindness in particular. If you've never been to Arlington National Cemetery, you need to go. You need to go. And you want to see the compassion and kindness of America, you'll watch soldiers guarding the tombs of soldiers that we don't even know their names. Why? Kindness and compassion. So, amazing landscapes, sure. Fertile fields, yes. Natural resources, absolutely. Oceanic defenses, sure. Economic might, absolutely. Military, yes. Compassion and kindness. How about this? Something that makes America great. Freedom. Freedom. Forgive me the freedom to believe whatever you want. Hmm? The freedom to assemble with people who believe like you believe. Hmm? The freedom to speak your mind. I realize that there's getting a crunch on that. You know that, I know that. Clamping down on free speech, but... Let me tell you something. You say some of the things that we say in America and other countries, and you're going to jail for a very, very, very long time. You know, you have the freedom to associate and to disassociate. You can decide where you spend your money, and you can decide where you don't spend your money. That's America. That's freedom. Oh, I think about this, and this one's probably highest on my list of things that make America great. Our structure and system of government make America great. If it's been a long time since you took a civics class, let me tell you something. We have three branches of government, and each one has a check and a balance on the other to make sure that one does not get too much power. That is the genius of our system the constitutional system of government. But, and I literally think it is the greatest form of government that has ever been devised by the minds of men. You think about how each state has two senators, but each state has a population that produces their Congress people. It's beautiful. It's genius. We think, and we've seen recently how, praise God, uh, a, a, a judiciary can uh, right the ship get back to saying the Constitution says some things and it doesn't say some things, amen? Again, that's part of America's greatness, absolutely, absolutely. However, while these and others, I believe, contribute to America's greatness, they are not the source of it. So what makes America great, Pastor? Well, I could go, and Brother Garraway did such a great job a few weeks back talking about many of these things, and he had so many quotes. I, I just can't do that this morning. I've got two quotes that I think really sum things up. One is by George Washington, our first president, the one they wanted to make king but refused. He said in his first inaugural address, April 30th, 1789, no people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation which disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself ordained. Amen. You know what in essence he's saying there? We need to acknowledge God. We need God as the one who blessed us with America, and we need to listen to what he has to say. And then there was two men, clergymen, Andrew Reed and James Matheson, who visited America in 1834, and they wrote a book called A Narrative of the Visit to American Churches in 1835, and they said this, America will be great as America is good. If not, her greatness will vanish away like a morning cloud. Wherein does 
America's greatness reside? Well, I think if you go back to those pilgrims who landed on Cape Cod in 1620, anybody remember why they made that venture? They said, for the glory of God. For the glory of God and the, adma- and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's what they said before they left. They wrote it in the Mayflower Compact. We look back and we, we think of times like 1776 when rebellion to tyrants was patriotism. People stood their ground. We think of 1863 just two days ago when the Battle of Gettysburg commenced and brother fought against brother. And I think of 1940-44 when uh, the D-Day invasion took place and and our soldiers mark on that crusade to rid the world of tyranny. I think that there was always one thing that underlied every one of those time periods. And it was simply this, the fear of God. The fear of God. The reverence, obedience to God and fear of God in America, that America had, forgive me, a general societal fear of the Almighty. I want to talk to you about that today, because I believe that America is forsaking the attribute of greatness. Look back with me there in Proverbs chapter 14, and we see the declaration, just by way of, of, of introduction, and I'll get into the thought and the body of the message Just by way of introduction, we see the declaration. The declaration. And that is namely this. It says, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Listen, righteousness, right living, being right before God, I want to tell you something, starts with the fear of the Lord. You will never be right with God until you fear the Lord, until you have a healthy fear of God. And he makes here a declaration. He says that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Ladies and gentlemen, you do not have to be a Christian long to look around at our nation and see that sin is not only on the rise, it is absolutely everywhere and being promoted. And you know what it is? A reproach. You say, do you think so, Pastor? It doesn't matter what I think. God said it is. It's a reproach to any people. Literally, in our country right now, and again, I know, I I understand a little bit about this issue, but we have a, a, a whole bunch of people in our country that are upset that murder is no longer birth control. That tells me something. It tells me that sin is a reproach to any people. It says there, the declaration. I think about Joshua 24, 14. As Joshua's getting ready to pass off the scene, he says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood in Egypt and serve the Lord. There's a declaration. But then, if you look at Proverbs 16, you're there in Proverbs 14, just go over a page. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 6. We see the departure. The fear of God will cause something in us. And we're going to look at uh, different parts, aspects of the fear of God here. But it says there in verse 6, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men what? Depart from evil. Why is it that men uh, are, are, are uh, bent on doing evil? I can tell you why. There is no fear of God before their eyes. As Psalm 36 verse 1 tells us, as we look and we see and we know our Bibles and we know Romans chapter 1 and we know 2 Timothy chapter 3 and we know the days of Noah and the days of Lot are upon us and we see this world getting more and more wicked. Why? No fear of God. No fear of God. So there's the declaration, righteousness, right living, that begins with the fear of God, exalteth the nation. It makes America great. 
But the departure, there in verse 6, it says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. But then, if you go to Proverbs chapter 1, we read, we see the decision. Not only the declaration and the departure in regards to fearing God, but we see the decision. Can I tell you something? As a believer in Christ today, if you're here and you're saved, you know the Lord, you still have to make a decision to live your life in the fear of God. You can be saved and not fear God. Do you know that? Because why? Salvation's a decision you make. But I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. As we look at, we see this lost world, and I appreciate Pastor Alex's song, Let Us Weep, yes, But it tells us why in verse 29. Verse 30 or verse 28 says, Then shall they call upon me. This is after they have forsaken everything. They didn't want to have anything to do with God, didn't want his knowledge, didn't want his rules, didn't want him. Verse 28 Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not, what? Choose the fear of the Lord. See, our God is not someone who just wants robots that simply obey Him. That is why we obey Him. No. He wants us to look, and we're going to look at some of the reasons. He wants us to look and realize His love for us, realize how much He has for us, and realize who He is. It's a decision. You live your life in that decision. You either live your life in the fear of the Lord or you don't. So I want to look at today. America is forsaking the and we have that in capital letters, the attribute of her greatness. Her, her, the, the attribute of her greatness is when you go back to our founding, you look at men who had a fear of God. Different key points in our history, men that fear God. Ben Franklin who said, look, we, we, need, to, we need to stop this Continental Congress and pray for God's favor. Let's look at the fear of the Lord today. Number one, the causes or the motivators of the fear of the Lord. You can move through your Bibles today if you want to. If not, you can just listen. But look at Psalm chapter 33 if you'd like to go there. Psalm chapter 33. The first cause or motivator to fear the Lord or why we should fear the Lord is because of His greatness. His greatness. If you look there at Psalm chapter 33, in verse 8, by the way, you should, you should, if you don't have a Bible, you need a Bible. We'll be glad to get you a Bible, amen. You need the Word of God. When we look at these verses, amen, so this is not my opinion. This is what the Word of God says. It says there in chapter 33, <clears throat> verse number uh, 8, please. It says, let all the earth, what? Fear the Lord. Why? Let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spake... And it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Amen. Oh, we think of another time where uh, here it's talking about the creation, that everything we see that God created, He simply spake and it was. Oh, that ought to cause us to fear the Lord. Amen. But then also, I think about what it says in Joshua uh, chapter number 4, when He parted the Jordan River. It says, verse 23, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you, and ye were passed over as the Lord your God did upon the Red Sea when He dried up from before us until you were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty and that ye might fear the Lord your God. His greatness, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that the Lord is great in all His acts ought to cause us to fear the Lord. To fear the Lord. But not only His greatness, I think about His goodness. And the Bible says in 
the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 12, verse number 24. 1 Samuel 12 and 24, it says this, Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things He hath done for you. You know, if you'll just stop and pause and look at your life, and I realize I've known people that have had heartaches and they, Brother Stark, they almost took my breath away as they began to tell me about the heartaches that they had. They weren't, they weren't complaining, they were just saying that these are things that had happened in their life. And some people have more than others. But I promise you this, if you'll just go back and look at your life and think of all the good things that God has done for you. All the, think, uh, listen, you, you, you with the hoary head, think about your family. Hmm? Think about the people that God has given you in your life. Think about how he's provided for every last need all through the years. When you didn't know how you were going to make it and God made it happen. And you think about all the spiritual blessings that we have. Your salvation, which can never be taken away from you. Your justification, your redemption, all these big theological words, which just simply means that God's never going to let go of you. Has he been good to you? Yeah, he has. The fear of the Lord. We ought to fear him because of his greatness. Because of his goodness. And I, this is not a word, but I made it a word, amen. A pastor's prerogative. I call this his godness. Not only his greatness and his goodness, but his godness. You remember what Jesus said to his disciples as they were getting ready to go out, hated of all men? He said this in Matthew 10, 28. He said, don't fear them that can kill the body. That's all they can do. He said, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. What was in essence he saying to them? Fear God. Fear God. Peter said that, didn't he? First Peter chapter one, or I'm sorry, chapter two, verse 17. He said, Fear God. Honor the king. Amen. Fear God. Over and over and over. It tells us Hebrews 4:13 talks about uh, the, the phrase is used, with whom, with, with whom we have to do. It means one day we're going to stand before God. And we'll be glad we feared him. And we'll tremble if we didn't. Causes, the causes or motivators to fear the Lord. Secondly, the call, the call. Go with me You're there in Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 3. We'll look at a couple verses in Proverbs and then look at some verses in Deuteronomy as well. It's just a simple message really on the fear of the Lord. But as we look around, we see it's a missing ingredient in America. Used to have it. By the way, it doesn't mean it's completely gone. Thank God there's places like this that meet and people that truly do fear the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 7 of Proverbs, we know verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not on thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge Him, He shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. Go over to chapter 23, verse 17. Chapter 23, verse 17. It says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. The call. God calls His people to fear the Lord. Over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, back in the Old Testament there. Last book of the Pentateuch. It's a great chapter of the Word of God as God instructs His children getting ready to head into the promised land. Certainly some application for you and I today. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God. To keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou, and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, 
and all that thy days may be prolonged. Uh, if you look over, you're still there in chapter 6, look at verse 13. Verse number 13, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Down to verse 24, it says, and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always. What an incredible statement that is. Why does God want you to fear him? For your good. For your good. Parents, have you ever told your kids to do something and then didn't tell them the reason why? Come on now, am I the only one? I was like, everybody's looking at me like, do you ever tell them, hey, I don't want you to do that and I'm not, I'm not, by the way, engaging in a dialogue with a two-year-old is going to make you more like a two-year-old. It's not going to convince him, amen? You just have this long diatribe of why you shouldn't color on the wall. Don't do that, amen? That'll work just fine. But you, you told them something, you said, I don't want you to do this, and you didn't tell them why. Why? Because you're their father, or you're their mother, you're their parent. You have their best interest in heart. I love the fact it says there, fear the Lord. Why? It's for our good. It's for our good. So the call to fear the Lord. Let me give you... The, you hear fear of the Lord, and I know some of you are thinking, well, is, do I walk around like this? Let me give you the, the, the simple definition of what it is to fear the Lord. To stand in awe, to revere, to venerate to obedience. Let me say it again. To stand in awe, to revere, to venerate to obedience. Amen. And I always think about how God uses the illustration of chastening in Proverbs uh, there, and he says it over again in Hebrews chapter 12, and he said, we had fathers in our flesh that corrected us, and we gave them, Brother Mike, we gave them reverence. That's exactly what it is to fear the Lord. By the way, that's an important part of our worship. It's an important part of why we don't casual things down. Because in churches that where things get casual down, God becomes a buddy. He becomes the old man upstairs. And I'm here to tell you, He is not that. He is Almighty God. He is to be feared. Now, thank God He's a friend of sinners. Amen. But He is all-powerful, almighty, and He is to be feared. So the call defined, what is it defined? The definition of the fear of the Lord, to stand in awe, to revere, to venerate, to obedience. How about describe? What, what's a description of the fear of the Lord? Proverbs 14.2 says it. It says this, He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. Now, often the Bible talks about the way we live our life and gives us the, the illustration of walking. Walking. You're, you're walking towards a goal. The, he that walketh in his uprightness, meaning you know one day you're going to stand before God and what you do will be brought up before God and you say, you know what? Because I fear God, I am going to walk as He would have me to walk. I'm going to live my life as He would have me to live. Does it mean you'll never stumble? No, but you'll stumble a whole lot less if you keep the fear of the Lord in front of you. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. So there's the call defined. There's the, the call to fear the Lord described. But you know what? There's also the call demanded. And that's found in, remember the book of Ecclesiastes when, when Solomon, forgive me, Brother Jeff, he tried it all. He li Listen, nothing was restrained from Solomon. He, had, he was the richest man in all the world. He was king. He could have whatever he wanted. And he tried everything. And nothing in this world satisfied him. When you get to the very end of Ecclesiastes, the very end, he says this in chapter 12, verse 13. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He said, let me sum up life for you right here. Fear God and keep His commandments. And this is the whole duty of man, he said. So that call, 
That call to fear the Lord, it's defined to stand in awe, to revere, to venerate, to obedience. It's described as he that walketh uprightly, feareth the Lord. And it's demanded, it is the whole duty of man to fear the Lord. And if you do, you'll do what he says. So there's the causes, there's the call. And then, can we go back to Proverbs, and I want to look at some consequences of fearing the Lord. Some consequences. Now, every time we hear that word consequences, we think negative. Oh boy, here comes the consequences. But you know, God attaches a lot of good consequences to particular actions. Good results. So let's look at them here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Probably one of the most, I would say famous or most well-known verses here. Proverbs 1, 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you look at chapter 9, verse 10, similar verse, it says there, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what, what, what's a consequence when we fear the Lord? It brings wisdom to us. God imparts wisdom to those who fear Him. Amen. Thank God. If I have any wisdom, it has come from God. If you have any wisdom, it has come from God. Fearing the Lord. So it brings wisdom. Here's one, chapter 14. Look at chapter 14, verses 26 and 27. We were there for our initial text. Love this. It says in verse 26, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence... And his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. You say, what do you see there, Pastor? I believe the fear of the Lord provides protection. It provides protection. If you look at chapter 19, verse 23 of Proverbs, it says, The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. And he that hath it shall be satisfied, shall not be visited with evil. When you fear the Lord, God protects you from things, least of all yourself, and forgive me, stupid decisions. Amen. Oh, how many did I make in my life before I feared the Lord? Thank God for the ones that He's kept me from. It provides protection. Oh, we read in chapter 16, verse 6, it says the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. But I want you to go and look at chapter 8, verse 13, please. Something else that goes right along with that. We live in an age where there's a particular word we're not allowed to use anymore. By the way, it's used a lot of people like us. It's the word hate or hater. Oh, you're just a hater. You just hate people. No, no. Verse 13 says, the fear of the Lord is to what? Hate evil. To hate evil. We we say, listen, we love the sinner and hate the sin. This is a verse you get that from. Hate evil. Hey, by the way, the best place to hate evil is in yourself. Amen? Start there and work outwards. Amen? Amen? But it says there that, uh, that the, the idea of the fear of the Lord will not only depart from evil, but it will cause us to have a holy hatred of evil. By the way, I could go on. There's so much more. I'll give you one more. Chapter 22, verse 4. Chapter 22, verse 4. It says, By humility and the fear of the Lord our riches and honor and life. What do you see there? I see the fear of the Lord brings material blessings, prosperity. Oh, I'm not, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm telling you, fear the Lord and watch God bless you. It'll happen. Why? Because God promised it would. That doesn't mean you're going to see everything you would like financially and, and have a, all the riches of the world or anything like it. It means God's going to take care of you. So there's the causes or motivators to fear the Lord. There's the call to fear the Lord, defined, described, demanded. There's the consequences. It brings wisdom. It provides protection. 
It causes us to depart from evil. It brings material blessings and prosperity. And then lastly, if you look over at Proverbs chapter 1, I want to look at the condemnation of those who choose not to fear the Lord. The condemnation of those who choose not to fear the Lord. You see it there in verse 29, verse 28. We read already, it says, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but shall not find me. Not, God's not going to give wisdom to these that have completely forsaken him. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despise all my proof. So here's the condemnation. Therefore, because of that, shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Why are things the way they are in America right now? Now, by the way, again, for people that say this is the most divisive time ever in the history of America, I would bring you back to the Civil War when Americans shot each other on different sides. Some of you lived through the riotous days of 1968. You remember what America was like then. It's not the most divided day, but it's getting there. Why, why are things the way they are out there? I can tell you why. There is no fear of the Lord before their eyes. And what's happening out there is a consequence, just like God said. Verse 29, uh, verse 31, I'm sorry, they shall eat the fruit of their own way. When you don't root your life in the fear of the Lord, you have no foundation. You have, you have no hope, nothing you can turn to when things go bad. You remember the story, the two stories. We know it's such a child's story, but there is such depth in the story of the parable of the wise man and the foolish man. You know, one of the big takeaways I had from that, Brother Talbert, is that storms come to everybody. They come to everybody. But when you root your life in the fear of the Lord, when the storms come... The house stands. Does, by the way, does it mean there won't be tears? Oh, goodness, no. Does it mean there won't be heartaches? Oh, no. Losing somebody and, 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 and having reverse in our life, having sickness, all these things, they bring tears, they bring emotional breakdowns, all that. But it stands because we know God. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. When you look out at this world and we look at people, listen, we're, we're questioning biology. This is not difficult. This is, it's not difficult. Just ask a child. Ask a two-year-old. Is that a boy or a girl? Yeah, they'll tell you. Ask a professor, you'll get a longer answer. Where is that? There's no fear of God. There's no fear of God, the creator who created them, male and female. You look at the, the way things are going and, and the, the lack of regard for life out there. Where does that come from? The fear of God. And I want to point in a lot this way. Well, let's look this way. Do you fear the Lord? Oh, you, 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 yes, absolutely I do. Okay. How's your Bible reading? How about your gospel tracks? Are you passing out gospel tracks? I mean, we're talking about hell in our Sunday school class today, and, and we're talking about just thinking, you know, if we really believe in hell, it'd motivate us to empty the track rack out. Talk to other people. Just try. Say, well, what if they reject me? You try, because you really believe there's a hell. You really fear God. You really believe that if God said it, people are going there. I need to do something about it, Amen. You know, that prescription for revival that is preached a lot this time of year, it's in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people, it doesn't say if the world that doesn't fear God, it says if my people, which are called by my name, that's us, 
shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, will heal their land. Hey, there's a lot going on on here where there's no fear of God. Well, we ought to look inside the church house and say, do I fear God? Am I living my, am I walking uprightly? Because that's what the Bible says is the consequence of fearing the Lord. I'll, I'll be walking uprightly. I'll be, I'll be doing right in my life. Doesn't mean you'll never stumble. You'll, you'll have a stumble. We'll all have a stumble. But generally your life says, listen, I fear the Lord. I fear the Lord. Maybe today you just need to say, get back to it and say, Lord, I need to fear you. I truly need to fear you in my life. Again, does that mean we just walk around like this all the time? No. Just, just like long ago, you had a dad, and you had the fear, we, we say you had the fear of God of your dad. Amen? I know I did. My dad saw to it that I knew he was my dad. That we weren't buddies or pals, he was my dad. It's the same thing with a God our Father, Amen? We're not buddies or pals. He's our dad. He is to be feared. By the way, he's to be feared for his greatness. Amen. He's the creator. But he's to be feared for his goodness. Think of all the good things. And his godness. Amen. The fear of the Lord. It's the missing ingredient, I believe. It's the, it's the ingredient that America is forsaking. That is the attribute of our greatness. We need to get back to it. Let's start here and work our way out. Father, we love you. Thank you. Lord, thank you for these thoughts on the fear of the Lord. Lord, thank you. Lord, you said over and over, only fear the Lord. Only fear the Lord. And you said it's for our good. Lord, you're not keeping anything from us by us fearing and serving you. You're giving us the best things you want for us. We look at our world. We look at our country. We see it spiraling out of control. But we talk about revival. May it start here in our hearts with a healthy fear of the Lord. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, Brother Kevin's going to be playing a hymn of invitation about page 509, Brother Kevin. In times like these, we need a Savior. Our heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, listen to me. Listen to me, please. You go back to the Garden of Eden, you find Adam and Eve sinning being banished from the garden, and they died spiritually that day. And God had a plan. <clears throat> he said in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3 that He would raise up a Redeemer. And in the fullness of the time, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And He lived a perfect, sinless life, something that no one before or since has ever done. And he died upon an old rugged cross. He allowed himself to be crucified and shed his blood for your sins and mine. And three days later, glory to God, he rose from the, the dead, glo gloriously victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he says this, tells us that all men are sinners. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Tells us that all sinners owe the payment of sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. He tells us that all sinners are loved by God. God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We owe the wages of sin, which is death. Christ died for us. He died in our place. He made our payment for us. And he says this, if you'll recognize those things, that you're a sinner, that you owe the payment, that God loves you, you can't save yourself, 
and you'll call upon him and ask him to save you. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Him and him alone. Not him plus your baptism. Not him plus your church membership. Not him plus your charity. Him. You'll go to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I cannot save myself. I'm trusting in you and what you did on the cross for me to save me from my sins. I believe you died and rose again for me. Please forgive me of my sins and take me to heaven when I die. I promise you, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I did that 27 years ago. My life has never been the same. Say, do you always feel safe, Pastor? Nope. Nope. Many times I feel like just in the flesh and issues and sin and all that, but God's word hasn't changed. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here today and you have been saved, but you've not yet been baptized in deep water after salvation, as the Bible commands, it's time to fear the Lord. It's time to fear the Lord. It's time to say, God, you get first place in my life. I don't really want to do this, but I know I should. And I'm giving in. I'm submitting to you. Maybe there are those of you that like to submit yourself to church membership. We've had many folks visiting. Come and present yourself, and we'll set up a time where we can meet and talk about what it is to be a member here at the church. Most of all, if you're here today and you're not saved, God wants to save you. But you've got to receive it. You've got to choose. Just like we talked about choosing to fear the Lord or not, you can either choose to be saved or not. By the way, both have eternal consequences, one in heaven, one in hell. Bless, Father, our invitation time. May not one grieve, quench, or resist what you're trying to do in their lives. Help us that name your name to fear you. I pray in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. It's page 509. The altar's open if you'd like to come. Maybe the Lord spoke to you about the fear of the Lord in your life, how you live your life. Maybe it's this idea of being baptized. Maybe you need to be saved. You'd like to just have somebody take the Bible and walk you through what it is to be saved. We'd love to do that today. Stand and sing. Amen. Don't let the hymnal keep you in the pew if God wants you at the altar. Sing it now on that first verse, page 509. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's make sure we fear the Lord. Our lives will show it. Amen. Again, not talking about being perfect, just talking about having that undergirding fear of a holy God. Amen. So now, all right. We're going to head down to our pavilion. Those of you that are staying, great. Those of you that are not, we miss you already. Amen. Remember, no evening service tonight. We'll have no evening service. So we'll have uh, our picnic and then our service. And then uh, my wife does need some help. For there, if there are fellows that can help get some stuff out of the uh, uh, barn. And then I think we'll probably have a ball game after that, Lord willing. So uh, let's go ahead and pray. Brother Jeff Becker, would you come to the platform, sir, and uh, dismiss us in a word of prayer? And when you do, Brother Jeff, if you would ask God's blessing on the food, and uh, certainly would uh, appreciate that. Again, thank you for those of you being in God's house. Let's make sure we do it right in the offering. Amen. If you're a guest, please fill out that guest card so we can have a record of your uh, visit. I was putting together my prayer list to, uh, this week and uh, for folks that have been visiting, amen, and uh, folks that we see out here, we want to make sure we're praying for you, amen, and we give that to our deacons as well. So uh, if you haven't filled out a guest card, please do make sure it gets in the, uh, 
the offering uh, bucket there. So, Brother Jeff, please dismiss us, sir. The Lord loves you. I love you. Till we meet again, all God's people said, let's have some fellowship. Do it right.